1948 uh, in Germany uh, in a displaced persons camp. Uh, my mother is Ukrainian. My father is uh, from Moscow, which makes him Russian. Uh, they met in the, uh, in the DP camp in Germany in 1946. They got married there. And, you know, in the DP camps, displaced persons camps, uh, they were populated by people who just uh, overcame World War II, and many of them suffered greatly during the war. Um, and in all these GP camps, the first thing people did was build churches, erect churches and uh, barracks. Um, so my parents got married in you know, these churches, and I was born in 1948. 1950, we moved to the United States. And of course, in 1948, uh, Churchill declared uh, the Iron Curtain and the Cold War started. So I grew up in uh, a city called Cleveland, Ohio, uh, during the Cold War, <coughs> when it wasn't very <coughs> popular to be Russian because Russians were considered to be the arch enemies of the West and the, of America, particularly. Uh, in a way, sort of what's going on right now, I think, uh, in a way. So I grew up in a time when uh, uh, many of my friends were quickly ass assimilating into American culture, and I wanted to do the same thing. I was embarrassed to be Russian because uh, we were uh, uh, considered, well, if you're Russian, then you must be a communist. And my <clears throat> parents were obviously uh, very anti-communist. And it was, a hard, it was hard to explain to Americans that Russian, just because you're Russian doesn't mean you're communist. And that uh, Russia was uh, the first country which suffered under communism. So I grew, I grew up in this, um, in this atmosphere, not very conducive to being Russian. And I wanted to assimilate into American culture as, as much as my friends were, were doing. And uh, at about the age of 13 or 14, uh, I was forced by my parents to accompany my grandmother uh, to church uh, Saturday evening. And, you know, I, I was an avid baseball player <laughs> back then. And all I wanted to do was just hang out with my friends and, and play baseball and become an American. So I was forced to, to accompany my grandmother to the church, which was located in the very bad neighborhood in Cleveland on the east side. The church now has moved uh, to the suburbs, but when I was growing up, it was there. And I remember standing in church one Saturday evening that was literally no one there, um, just two or three people in the choir, the two or three elderly people standing in church. And here I am, a 14-year-old in the midst of this uh, church in this bad neighborhood. I didn't speak Russian very well. It was like a kitchen Russian, you know, Loshka Tarelka, you know, this uh, uh, very limited vocabulary. So Church Slavonic for me, of course, was like a foreign language. And I was standing in church and not knowing why I was there and what I'm doing here. And I couldn't understand the words of the priest or the choir. And suddenly at some point uh, during the service, I felt um, almost miraculously, probably it was a miracle. Suddenly I began, if not understanding the words, I understood the reason for the church services to be held. And uh, something, something happened in my heart that uh, helped me to understand these, these basic truths. And I, so basically I started, I was churched 
Thank you. Thanks to my grandmother to a certain extent. She was a very pious woman. My parents were occasional church goers, so to speak. So I used I would accompany my grandmother to church every Saturday. And then the priest, Father Michael Smirnov, of blessed memory, um, who became my first spiritual father, noticed me. There weren't very it was not difficult to notice me because I was the only young person in church. So he basically took, took me under his wing. He invited me into the altar to serve. He invited me to his house to um, learn how to read Church Slavonic. Um, I, back in my teenage years, I used to stutter, um, especially when I was stressed or was nervous. And I have to say that Father Michael helped me overcome this stuttering uh, deficiency by teaching me to read in church and to study. The first thing I learned was the six psalms. Um, so one day um, after one of these vigils, uh, I would sleep at my grandmother's house. This happened in 1966. We came home and my father called me uh, and said that uh, the very important hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia passed away. And uh, the hierarch's name was Archbishop John Maximovich. And when my father told me this, uh, I didn't know any bishops of World War back then, I was just a beginner. Um, but I remember when my father said that Lodika John passed away, something pinched my heart. And I had this, this feeling that uh, Archbishop John, <clears throat> although he was dead physically, that he would one day pay, play an important role in my life. Of course, I didn't understand what that, what that, what that could be. But uh, later on, at the age of uh, 28, when I was uh, moving from my first parish to Washington, D.C., I learned that the parish in Washington, D.C. was founded by Archbishop John in 1949. And I was to become the rector of the only church in America that was founded by St. John. Um, St. John played another role in my life, of course, because uh, in 1970, um, I went to the Holy Land and I met my first Matushka, I mean, my only Matushka, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and she happened in her childhood, she was the spiritual daughter of St. John. She's from Paris, France. And of course, uh, Archbishop John, after, after um, uh, China, who was assigned to be the Bishop of Brussels and uh, Western, uh, Western uh, uh, oh. Europe. And his, his cathedral was in Paris, a small little church. And she knew him very well from in childhood. So, that was the second factor of St. John um, in my life. And of course, it was the most important one because that we've been happily married, successfully married, I should say also, uh, from a spiritual standpoint for 50 years now. Well, in August, we'll, we'll, be, we'll have been married 50 years. So when um, I started being churched back in Cleveland, um, I started learning some Russian, and uh, I, I had a burning desire to, um, to go to the summit seminary in Jordanville. Uh, I spent two summers as a summer boy in Jordanville, and uh, I think one of the things, the topics that I had to speak about was uh, people who influenced me in my life. I already mentioned my grandmother, Father Michael Smirnov of blessed memory, Archbishop John. Um, and in seminary, uh, 
I mean, in the summer boy program, there was a seminarian from uh, Australia, his name was Vladimir Yipsukov, who took care of the summer boys. Um, he, he had a very big influence on me as well. Uh, he taught me many things. He introduced me to St. Mark of Ephesus. Back in the 60s, Jordanville published a, a book by uh, Archimandrite Androsi Pogodin on, uh, on St. Mark and, and the uh, Council of Florence. And uh, I know that Vladimir Svitsukov was very much into that and taught me a lot about St. Mark and other, other great saints and fathers of the church. So he played a very big role in my life as well. So slowly but surely, I, be, I became very much interested in my spiritual homeland, Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, being a summer boy in Jordanville and uh, meeting the old timers, the, the, the old monks, um, many of them who had become monks in Russia, Ukraine, uh, in the 30s, in Vladimirova. Uh, it was uh, a wonderful schooling for me to have known these saintly people, and I will say. I, I, can, I can go through a list of them, but I'm not going to take your time. I think you know who I'm speaking about. Many of them are buried in the Brotherhood Cemetery behind the cathedral in Georgia. <clears throat> um, after seminary, which I graduated from in 1972, um, we had a, our seminary class was very large at the beginning. I, I think we had 13, 14 students. And uh, when the time for graduation came, I think there were only four people who graduated. Uh, one of them was Metropolitan Hilarion, our present first hierarch. The father, um, let me see, who else? Well, it doesn't matter. Um, I became, a, I, I was, a, my last year in seminary, I was a deacon. And we were living with my new, newly wedded Matushka in Nyack, New York. And I very much wanted to uh, be a deacon for Father Serafim Slobodskoy. Uh, that was my dream, to, to, to be with a priest who was very experienced, uh, who was very well known, thanks to his books of conversion. The Father um, Serafim died. Uh, he had a congenital heart failure. He died, so I spent three years serving uh, as a deacon in Nyack with Father George Ladin, one of the eldest priests in Volkwa. Um, and at the same time, Matushka and I worked uh, at the Tolstoy Foundation nursing home in, uh, near Nyack, which was a wonderful school for me as well because uh, we took care of old Russian people. And um, for me, a future priest, um, it was very important to see and to learn from people who were living their last days. Because almost every week uh, we uh, attended funerals for some of the people, some of the residents of the nursing home. And it became very personal for me. And it gave me. Uh, how do you say, um, the experience of, of grief and overcoming grief with the help of the church. So I, I spent three years working there and one day I was convinced by Archbishop Nikon Kretlitsky, the uh, biographer of Metropolitan Anthony Kretlitsky, a wonderful man, very uh, knowledgeable, uh, he uh, pleaded with me to become a priest and move to Stratford, Connecticut, uh, which had joined the World War uh, in 1970. So I was ordained by Metropolitan Filaret in uh, Novozivevo in 1972. 
Then I moved to my new parish. It was a wonderful small parish, uh, not far from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, from Yale University. And I was a priest there for three years. And um, at the same time, I um, landed a job in New York on 42nd Street, a place called Bedford Publications. Bedford Publications was uh, uh, actually a CIA front. <laughs> it was a, a, a publishing house, quote unquote, that was funded by the CIA. And what they did was they published books, translation of Western classics into Russian, um, books like 1984 by George Orwell, um, uh, Animal Farm, uh, also dissident books, Samizdat books, uh, anything to do with anti-communism, with, 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 yeah, with anti-communism. So I, I would spend an hour and a half uh, commuting from Stratford, Connecticut to New York every single day, one way and an hour and a half back home. So I spent three hours in the train what can you do in a train for three hours every day? You can either sleep or you can read. So I spent um, three years um, commuting back and forth uh, to New York from Stratford, Connecticut. And I, I read a book a week, and which helped me to uh, perfect my Russian. And of course, to learn more about uh, the history of the modern history of Russia and uh, what happened in 1917. And um, my job at Butler Publications was to interview uh, emigres from the Soviet Union. And most of the emigres in the 70s were mostly of Jewish descent. And well, the interesting thing I learned in, in the hundreds of interviews that I conducted, uh, I had a form uh, with questions and I would ask these questions, what books did you read? What um, education did you receive? Uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, most of these people were well-educated. Some of them had two educations, higher educations. And what I learned was that even from the Jewish Emigrate, immigration, the thing that they lacked most of all was religious literature. So I wrote a memo to the uh, administration of Bedford Publications that uh, we should invest money uh, in religious literature. So I was charged with um, coming up with a list of books that uh, people in Russia need and want. Uh, so I was, I started buying these books from YMCA Press in Paris, from Jordanville, of course, uh, and any publisher of Russian religious literature. Um, and we started smuggling these books into the Soviet Union. We would find professors, um, <clears throat> came on exchange programs, we would uh, send books to uh, people in different country, in different cities of the U.S. Uh, who lived in port cities, and they they could meet Soviet sailors, um, scientists, and so on and so forth. And that was my job. So I was interviewing emigrants from Russia. I was purchasing religious literature and finding people who could smuggle this literature into Russia. So I worked at this job for three years. Uh, and it helped me in, in many ways. I, I, I met many interesting people, uh, many dissidents. Uh, I, um, I read a lot every, every day. Um, and then suddenly I was called into my boss's office uh, and, and told that uh, 
uh, you are working for the CIA. I, I, I had no idea. Uh, it was hidden from me at first. I guess they, they didn't know, they didn't know that I could be trusted or whatever. But soon after that, um, um, like many good federal programs in this country, uh, the budget was cut. Um, and um, the staffing at Bedford Publications also had to be cut. So the administration looked at my resume and said, well, listen, you're a, you're a Russian Orthodox priest. Uh, surely your parish can take care of you. Well, little did they know that my parish was very small and I, I got next to nothing as a salary. My main salary was, of course, the, the job that I, I, was, I held with Bed Bedford Publications. So I was let go. And um, I needed to find a job because I, 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 had, I had children already. And um, I couldn't imagine working for any in a factory or an office that didn't, didn't have something to do with Russia. Um, I needed to find something that uh, I could somehow serve the suffering Russian people. So I went on unemployment insurance for a year, um, looking desperately looking for the right job. And my unemployment insurance was coming to an end. I was getting very um, stressed out about that. Uh, <clears throat> one day, well, not one day, uh, there was a very unpleasant things began happening in my parish. Uh, I won't go into the details, but um, things came to a head one, one day and we were sitting with uh, my Matushka after vigil and she um, asked me a question. Did you, did you ever regret becoming a priest? And uh, I think, you know, like many young, young people, uh, I had this idealistic view of, uh, of the priesthood. I had this idealistic view of, of Russians in, in the West that uh, they would respect the priests and uh, uh, you know, treat them right and all that. And, uh, when as, as a young priest, uh, unexperienced, I came upon the first unpleasant experience of gossip and things like that. It was very, very stressful for us, for Matushka and me. Um, and we were sitting after vigil and she asked me, Do you, did you ever regret becoming a priest? And uh, I, I told her that, you know, the thing that it's difficult to explain to a person who's not ordained is the, the joy that a priest receives from standing before the holy altar table and serving the bloodless sacrifice. That gives me so much um, energy, <clears throat> spiritual energy. Um, and she was very satisfied with that answer. So we went to bed. And that night, um, I had a dream. Now, I usually discourage people from believe, believing dreams because believing in all your dreams can lead you to, to big trouble. Uh, but this dream was very uh, providential, I would say. Uh, Lodika John appeared to me in this dream. And he asked me a question. Uh, he, well, actually, he, we had a conversation. Uh, it was more of a mo monologue. And the only thing I remember from that monologue was he asked me a question. Uh, do you regret becoming a priest? The same question my mother asked me before we went to sleep. And I said, no, Vladika. And I basically gave him the same answer I gave to my mother. Um, <clears throat> 
And he said, well, I don't regret that you became a priest either. And I woke up the next morning as if all the troubles of the world had just fallen from my shoulders. And I had this thought that everything will be all right. And that I will find this dream job that I was hoping to receive. <clears throat> and then the, it came to me that maybe I should write a letter to Western radio stations and ask if they have a position for a person like me. So I wrote to the Voice of America and I put the letter into the mailbox thinking, well, it's probably doubtful that he would ever even answer my, my letter. Uh, but five or six days later, I can't remember for sure now, I got a call from Washington, D.C., the Voice of America, from a Nikita Moravsky, who later became a very close friend and colleague of mine, uh, offering me to go to New York and uh, uh, be tested for my knowledge of Russian. Um, and he asked me, I remember, in the telephone call, now, mind you, I just graduated from seminary. I, I was uh, uh, a deacon and a priest for six years. Uh, I had very little experience beyond that. And he, he asked me, all right, what, what can you do besides, uh, besides giving sermons? <laughs> uh, in one of my, my letters, I said, I'm a priest. I'm used to speaking to other people, blah, blah. And he says, well, what else can you do besides giving sermons? I can do everything. I don't know what in the world, you know, uh, inspired me to say that, but I guess it was the correct answer to, say, to give at the time. So anyway, I went to New York. I brought my portable Russian typewriter with me. I was allowed to bring uh, Russian dictionaries. I was given these, uh, uh, these articles to translate into Russian. Well, basically I passed the test and I was invited to come to Washington um, to, to start work as a journalist with for the Voice of America, for the Russian service of the Voice of America. Well, you, you can imagine how ecstatically happy I was. This is a, a fantastic opportunity. It just so happened that the parish in Washington needed a second priest, the Father Nikolai Pekatoros, a Russian Greek. Uh, he was in his 80s. He was uh, very advanced in his age, of course. Uh, he was also very happy that uh, he would be getting a young priest as an assistant. Uh, Metropolitan Filaret signed off on that. And uh, I had to find uh, a priest for Stratford. So I promised my parish that every weekend I would commute from Washington to Stratford, Connecticut by train to serve until they found, if we, if we found a priest. So that about Three months later, a, a priest through for the Stratford Parish was found. So I was able to uh, work and serve here in Washington, D.C. Um, but I was hired uh, to be a translator, just to sit at the, the desk and translate uh, uh, scripts that would be given from the Central Division of Voice of America. Um, there was a religious broadcast then, uh, a Russian Jew by the name of Vladimir Matin uh, was in charge. And uh, one day at one of, our, one of our board meetings at the Voice of America, Vladimir said, why should I be, why should he be doing religious broadcasts when we have on staff a Russian Orthodox priest? So I was given <clears throat> the opportunity um, to take over the religious broadcasting of the Russian service of the Voice of America. Um, so 
there are many interesting stories uh, that I could tell you, but we don't have the time. But um, my, my biggest break, uh, which helped me to expand my broadcast, happened uh, uh, just before Christmas in 1980, I believe, or 81. Um, Father Andrei, when did Solzhenitsyn, when was he exiled from Russia? What 1974. Okay, 74, right? Yes. So then this happened in 1974, right? In 1980, um, I, I did a broadcast um, on the meaning and structure of the nativity services in the Orthodox Church. It was a half hour broadcast, uh, a special. And um, then we, the, the management of the Russian service of Voice of America uh, called me in uh, to a meeting and showed me a letter that Alexandra Solzhenitsyn wrote to them, praising the anonymous author of this broadcast. Uh, you see, in 1980, I was doing the, my, my broadcast anonymously. I didn't introduce myself at the beginning because the management is very uncomfortable about ha having a, a, a broadcaster um, identify himself as a priest. <laughs> um, so after this letter from Solzhenitsyn, they said, all right, you can introduce yourself uh, at the beginning of your broadcast as Svishenik Viktor Potapin, priest Viktor Potapin, which I started doing. Um, and then after, soon after that, I became bolder. And um, there was a, a jubilee, uh, a Leo Tolstoy jubilee, I think one of, one of his anniversaries of his death or something like that. And I did a broadcast, a special on a Tolstoy and the church. And uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote a second letter. Uh, this is from Vermont. He was living in Vermont. Again, praising this broadcast. Because I usually, you know, when they talk about Tolstoy uh, and his uh, collisions with the church, it's usually the church is, is to blame and Tolstoy is a wonderful spiritual uh, writer and philosopher and whatever, and the, the, the church's viewpoint is never presented. Well, I, I presented the church's viewpoint in this broadcast, and Solzhenitsyn was delighted, and I was given 45 minutes. It was the longest uh, uh, special broadcast uh, of the Voice of America, 45-minute broadcast, two original broadcasts a week, they were repeated five times each. So I was, by then, I was, I was um, charged with uh, counting the repeats about 15 hours of broadcast a week to the Voice of America, uh, to Russia. Uh, I became, when I became rector of the, of the parish in Washington, um, Archbishop uh, Grigori Grabe, was our ruling bishop for a short time. He made me an archpriest. And I remember he, when he made me an archpriest uh, in his greeting after liturgy, uh, he said, well, we, we made Father Victor a archpriest, not because he's so experienced and so knowledgeable, but, but because he's the, the, the rector of a very important parish in Washington. <laughs> well, that was very humbling. Thank, thank you, Vladika. Uh, so after I became an archpriest, uh, again being inexperienced, uh, I needed to. I, I began introducing myself at the beginning of my broadcast as I, I would say, um, This broadcast is brought to you by Archpriest Victor Papa. and um, Archbishop. Ioan Shachavskoy, Archbishop John Shachavskoy, who was a retired OCA bishop. He was living in Santa Barbara, California. Um, 
who was broadcasting five minute sermons on the Voice of America from 1950, I, I think. And when I was given this religious broadcast to manage, uh, we incorporated his five minute sermon into my broadcast. And he would avidly listen on a shortwave radio in California every Sunday, my broadcast. Uh, sometimes I had to uh, cut out two or three minutes of his sermon because uh, it was just too long and it wouldn't fit into my 45 minute format. And sometimes he would say, well, why did you cut out these two minutes or whatever? So he was very intently listening to the broadcast. Uh, we, we became very good friends, not only colleagues, I visited him a couple of times. And I remember, um, I remember one day he wrote me a letter. Uh, I was introducing myself as our priest for about four or five times. And then I became very uncomfortable with that. I said, what difference does it make? I'm a priest, archpriest, priest doesn't matter to my listeners. So I reverted back to just saying, when you could afford a Swishin, you could the proper. So I got a letter from Archbishop John, and he wrote, Dear uh, Archpriest Victor, Axios, Axios, Axios. And then he told me uh, a story in this letter. He says, you know, there was an old bishop um, in Russia who proposed that at the day of the ordination of a priest, a priest should get every single award that can be given at the beginning. And then slowly but surely, upon gaining more spiritual wisdom and experience, to take away each of those, uh, each of those uh, awards. So that was very nice. And he, I remember, he sent me this, uh, this wonderful uh, portrait, photograph of St. John of Kronstadt with a, a little inscription on the back. Um, so, <laughs> as you can imagine, all these things working for the Bedford publications, reading uh, anti-Soviet literature three hours a day, um, being a Rokor priest, meeting all these wonderful monks um, in Jordanville as, as a summer boy and then seminarian, um, working with them and praying with them shoulder to shoulder, uh, meeting my Matushka at the, at the sep Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the spiritual daughter of St. John of Shanghai. All of these things, and of course my work at the Voice of America for 30 years, um, and being a priest here in Washington and developing a very close relationship with Russian diplomats, well, of course, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, all these things led to uh, my desire, if you will, to serve the Russian people, the suffering Russian people. Uh, also, I should mention that uh, when I moved to Washington, Father Alexander Kisilov, uh, who was a, a very well-known priest, he was the uh, uh, Patriarch Alexei II, he was an uh, altar server with, in Estonia when Father Alexander served there as a priest. So they were very close. Uh, he founded the Committee for the Defense of Persecuted Orthodox Christians, which was a wonderful organization. And he invited me uh, to be a member. This was a, a very uh, wonderful interjurisdictional committee in which uh, we had Greeks, we had OCA and Rokor people working together. And we actually had the blessing <clears throat> of Metropolitan Filaret, Metropolitan Irinye of the OCA, and Archbishop Iacobus for our work. So when I moved to Washington, uh, Father, Seref, Father Alexander Isilov uh, 
asked me to become the chairman of this committee to carry on this work in Washington. He said this was uh, uh, important because uh, it was important for the committee to be headquartered in Washington, D.C. So we, uh, we expanded our work. We, we began, the Committee for the Defense of Orthodox Christians began publishing a, a journal called the Orthodox Monitor. If you go to the Jordanville Seminary Library, you'll see a whole complete set of these journals. These journals were published, I was the editor. It was a, a large magazine, uh, which we sent to our subscribers and we sent to, to con members of Congress. It consisted mostly of Samizdat material. We, we, we translated uh, Sami's religious, relig um, Russian religious Samizdat into English. Uh, and we spoke about the fate of, of prisoners of conscience, uh, re religious people who were being persecuted for their faith in Russia. Um, so we carried, out, carried on this work for, for many more years, uh, basically until the late 80s, when things in Russia began changing for the better. So all of these things uh, put together uh, both uh, developed this, this desire to serve the Russian people. But at the same time, uh, here in Washington, uh, we have a very vibrant English language community within our parish. And uh, from the very outset, when I became a rector, we started introducing English into our services. And that developed into serving uh, when we, when we I got a second assistant priest in, into uh, developed into uh, serving separate English liturgies, uh, English language uh, vigil services. Uh, so basically, over the span of the 45 years that I've been here in Washington, D.C., uh, our parish has spawned uh, two new parishes, uh, one in Beltsville, Maryland, headed by Father George Johnson who was a priest with us, and also a second parish in Kensington, Maryland, headed by Father John Johnson, who was also a priest with us. So it's an all, there are two all English parishes, and the, our cathedral in Washington continues to be a bilingual parish. Uh, we still have a large uh, convert uh, community, and we, of course we have many mixed marriages, we have Russians and Americans who have a need for uh, the English language. So I don't know if that uh, it's a very long introduction, but I would I would invite any any questions that you might have. Atiyat Victor, this is an inspiring test testimony, and I I mean, I mean uh, inspiring uh, really, not just as a polite filler. And I understand that. Uh, the goal of our church in Kavlenia is still to have personal meeting with Christ. And the most beautiful thing I heard today was uh, this account of a 14 year old uh, amateur baseball player who came to church. And I, I really, I, I mean, for whatever, whatever it was, but so I believe that was that moment, that epiphany, this meeting with Christ, that because it came out of nowhere, and that was really very, very inspiring. Uh, so that's you, you made you made my day big time by by sharing this with us. In 1988, I believe uh, I was visiting what came out from what you started. Uh, the, uh, it was. Unidentif uh, unidentified office somewhere on around 42nd Street where people from the Soviet Union could help themselves and take home uh, various, uh, various uh, uh, literature that was not available uh, there, ran by a blessed memory, Veronica Stein. So, and she passed, we all away. she passed away recently. Right, right, right. Memory, memory eternal. She was very beautiful, very, very beautiful person. And when we talk to Father Victor, we should realize that he's a legend. 
there was a special uh, magazine uh, published, uh, exchange magazine, there was Soviet Life magazine, magazine distributed in the United States. And there was America magazine distributed in the Soviet Union. And there was, a, 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 he was a cover uh, man featured on one of the covers of this magazine. And there were bags and bags and bags of mail stored by one of his parishioners, Natalia Prisovska, who collected those uh, mail, sorted, and then sometimes sent it to Jordanville to share, uh, because it was amazing source of information from all over the Soviet Union. So, and what is also uh, amazing that uh, uh, I came, uh, I, it's not what, what I'm going to say is amazing, but amazing that the level of engagement and understanding of Russia that we were learning. Because I remember I came to the seminar in Jordanville in 1990. So on my way to Jordanville, I spent a month uh, and the, uh, at St. Job's Monastery in Munich. And the level of engagement and understanding uh, uh, of Russia in Germany and in, in America, it was like the whole ocean between the two because in Germany, they really had very clear understanding about nuances of the life in the Soviet Union. Whereas in America, there were uh, there, uh, people whom I came across, whom I met in Jordanville, they vaguely understood what was going on in Russia. So that's why also I, I, I propose to talk about this because it's really interesting that Father Victor, how he uh, accommodated this knowledge, how he uh, started to uh, understand things much better, I mean, clearer and uh, sort of adequately. And, it's, and also he didn't mention his trips to Russia. He didn't mention that he met Bishop Lazarus there, who was uh, a rocker catacomb bishop uh, there. So those are just little accents that I meant uh, to, uh, to put uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm very glad that, that, that we had this talk and I learned a great deal. I now have to absorb it. So the floor is open for your questions, uh, gentlemen. Okay, I can, I can start. Um, uh, Father Victor, as much as you grew up in the United States, I will refer to what Father Andre uh, pointed just uh, earlier. Uh, could you please describe if there were any um, cultural shock after having this um, American understanding of Russia and meeting people, like meeting all new people who grew in a totally different environment? And if you considered them as your compatriots or you saw them as different kind of, also kind of people? Like if there was any cultural shock and how, how did you deal with it? Like how you personally accepted if 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 it existed? Well, you mean cultural shock, uh, my own or other people's cultural shock? Yes. Uh, well, uh, because I can I can expand it in a little bit. In Jordanville, uh, sometimes I find that um, some people who idolize um, uh, a Russian Empire for for good reasons, um, they. Um, uh, it's hard for them to accept some of the nuances, uh, like cultural nuances and cultural novelties that exist in uh, contemporary Russia. And when they see people um, arriving here to the United States, they um, almost internally, um, how, how do you say, oppose themselves to what, to what they observe. Divide, so, divide basically, right? The what? Divide, I think, I think uh, what, what uh, um, Ivan was talking, sort of dividing, uh, kind of. You know, I, uh, I think that might be one of the reasons we had a schism in Kulkor in 2007. Uh, because um, it was very hard for the old timers, uh, for some of the converts, to accept our reunification with uh, the Moscow Patriarchate because. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, 
Well, I think if Father Andre can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think the only condition for our reunification, which was given back in the 20s when we broke with the Moscow Patriarchy, was the fall of communism. Since the, our, our homeland is, is controlled by communists, we will never reunite with the Moscow Patriarchy because the Moscow Patriarchy is a puppet of the, of the, of the Soviet state. Well, communism fell in 1991 and reunification happened, the decision to reunify happened only in 2006. Uh, and it happened, the actual reunification happened in 2007. So it took 16 years for us to overcome uh, this um, psychological barrier, if you will. We couldn't believe that communism could just disappear suddenly. So it took 16 years. So I think um, uh, that's probably one of the reasons why some group of uh, some parishes left real court. Uh, in 2007, because they couldn't overcome this shock, cultural shock, if you will. Um, but what I, what, what I can say is, uh, in, in my parish here, uh, it's, I would say my parish is made up about 65% uh, Russian, and the rest are Americans or English speakers. Uh, and of the 65%, I would say um, at least 40%, if not more, are people from Russia who are taking the place of the old timers who are basically, uh, they're dying off, obviously, because of old age. Uh, their children, uh, no children, well, they have, it's, it's a mixed bag. Some have left the church, uh, others have uh, uh, continued to go to church. But uh, uh, I would say that in my parish, um, it was very, well, you see, it's, it's getting complicated. Uh, when I came to Washington, the, our parish council was made up of old timers. And it was very difficult to get the, the uh, people from the former Soviet Union to join the parish or to become members of the parish council uh, because they had a mis mistrust of uh, uh, any kind of formal organizations because of the, the Soviet upbringing, I guess. They would not be Komsomol members or something like that. So, but I think over the years, this cultural shock uh, on our part and the part of the people who grew up in the West and the cultural shock that may have been experienced by people from the former Soviet Union doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, I, think, I think things have leveled out as far as any, in my parish in any case. Maybe it's because I understand people from the former Soviet Union uh, better than others not that I'm better, but just because of my life experience, uh, finding people who would smuggle books into Russia, uh, dealing with uh, the radio broadcasts and, uh, uh, and traveling to Russia back in the 80s and 90s. It gave me a great understanding of their psychology, where they're coming from. Uh, I hope that answers your question, at least partially. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would just add to that what Father Victor mentioned, that in 1927, as you remember, uh, gentlemen from our classes, that Russian, ch Russian church brought in order to uh, release from any responsibility for its activity, uh, the church administration in the Soviet Union uh, proclaim uh, uh, temporary autonomous from uh, any control from the Soviet Union. So that was a point 
why initially Russian Church abroad became separate. And then, of course, things were added up, added up to the point that some, some, some people started to ask, is uh, the Church of Russia is Orthodox? So it's a schism. So as I was also kind of thinking back then. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions uh, from, from, the, from you? Um, Father, uh, could you maybe expand a little bit more about the uh, reunification between Rokor and Russian Church and what, what part you played in it? Thank you. Well, um, you know, like many uh, clerics of Rokor, um, I was very vocal in my criticism of the Moscow Patriot. I was very critical even in my broadcasts. Uh, in, of, of the Moscow Patriot. Um, but I never ever uh, shared the view that the Moscow Patriot Age is without grace. But some of our fanatical members in the past had uh, suggested. Uh, so I always understood that, and you know, I'll tell you, uh, again, one of, one of the one of my most lasting memories of, um, was my first trip to Russia in 1984. This was five months before Gorbachev um, announced glasnos and perestroika. So I, I was able to, to uh, be in, in the Soviet Union during the well, the Zastoyna period, the time of stagnation, so to speak. So I was able to see the Soviet Union for what, what it was. Uh, I was given, I was already a radio broadcaster. I was already a well-known personality in Russia because people, I had been broadcasting since 1978. And I was given a, a diplomatic passport for my own protection. And I believe in 1984, I was the first a uh, priest of Rokor to ever visit the Soviet Union. Um, I remember coming, uh, walking from my hotel uh, to the Novodevichy convent. It was a long walk, about an hour. I was in the Ukraine hotel on the Moscow River. And I walked and I, that's, um, you know, I could recognize the pre-revolutionary uh, buildings as opposed to the Soviet buildings. It was, a, uh, it was at the end of November, 1984. It was cold and um, snowy, very dreary. It was overcast. And um, I was walking and I came up, uh, across, uh, came upon a, pre-revolutionary building, and you know, this was totally irrational, but I came up to the building and rubbed my shoulder against it, sort of <laughs> communing a pre-revolutionary Russia. So anyway, I, I made it to uh, to the church. I was uh, about five minutes late. Uh, it was in the large uh, uh, re refectory church, the Trapez Neitzerka. Um, and the choir was magnificent. And they were singing the Rachmanin of the Vesleví Gospel, which is absolutely beautiful because the altos sing the uh, melody. Uh, and I looked around and there were throngs of people. And there were many young people. And uh, I, I have to confess, I didn't pray very much at that service because I was just observing the, the first Soviet Russian people that I met in the homeland and they were all in church. And that was just so moving to me. Um, so I, this gave me, you know, I, I, this memory of being in the Movadevich convent and seeing, observing people praying in the church, I, I was thinking to myself, and how dare we say that there is no grace in this church? So that was, that was left. That made a big, indelible impression on me. 
And um, then over the years, you know, when I was broadcasting these uh, sermons of Father Alexander Main, uh, the dissident letters of Father Gleb Yakunin and other priests uh, who, who were all in the Moscow Patriarchy. They suffered uh, all because of their outspokenness. But again, I would ask myself that <clears throat> they are in the Moscow Patriarchy. How can, how can people say that they are Republicans? So, you see, I was critical of the Moscow Patriarchy myself, but at the same time, I never ever uh, was prepared to say that the Moscow Patriarchy was a bad race. So, in, uh, and I, I was active in that in that viewpoint. I wrote letters to Metropolitan Vitali uh, about this subject. Uh, you can read them. Father Andre gives you a blessing. <clears throat> Uh, but I was in um, when Metropolitan Lavr uh, came out <clears throat> and declared that we are entering into uh, a dialogue with the Moscow Patriarchy uh, to further, I mean, basically to to discuss reunification or. At the beginning, I think it wasn't even phrased like that. It was just, uh, we had, uh, uh, I was invited to uh, participate in a the first, uh, first meeting of representatives of uh, the Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor in, uh, 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 in Budapest, Hungary, in Santendra, which is a Serbian enclave. Uh, it was an unofficial meeting. There were a number of priests from, from uh, the MP and a number of priests from Rokor. We had a wonderful meeting where we discussed Metropolitan Sergius's declaration of 1927 and other issues that divided us, separated us. And then uh, in, I can't remember now the, the year when we, Soon after that, that was in 19, was that in 1999 or 19, 2000? My memory is not very good. Uh, we had a, a the first official meeting it was held at the Synod Synodal uh, Library in Moscow. And um, again, I was one of the invitees and I gave a talk on uh, 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 Rokor and the Holy Land. Um, so things got, things be began developing, uh, then a, a large group of uh, clergy from Rokor were invited to go to Russia uh, to visit and to learn more about the, the life of the church in Russia. And in 2006, uh, the Synod of Bishops of Rokor uh, charged me with becoming a member of the pre-conciliar committee, commission. Uh, so we, along with Father Serafim Gan, Father Peter Piripiostov, uh, we came together and we formulated the uh, uh, agenda for, the, uh, for our council that met in May of 2006. So, and then I was, of course, uh, as a member of the Preconciliar Commission, I was made a delegate to, uh, to the Sabor, to the Council in San Francisco, which ultimately decided that we would indeed uh, rejoin with uh, the Mother Church as an autonomous church within the Russian Orthodox Church. So that's just a very short, um, short description. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yes, Victor. Uh, more questions uh, from you, brothers? You can think, uh, and I will ask question unless you have one ready. Uh, <laughs> one ready. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. 
Father Victor, how do you envision um, the relationship between um, the Moscow Patriarchate and the uh, Rocker in the in the future? What do you think like will happen between these churches? Well, I wish Saint John would appear to me in a dream and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it's hard to say. <clears throat> Um, what what do you expect, maybe? I'm not a prophet. Um, I think for the foreseeable future, we will continue to be a Russian church in, in the sense that uh, there will be a need for the Russian language to be heard in our parishes. But you can... You can tell by just looking at the list of parishes in the Eastern American diocese that uh, I think we have like 80 parishes and uh, most of them are mission parishes. Most of them are uh, um, English language speaking parishes. Um, look at the seminary. Instruction is given in English. Um, so I think uh, the sooner we become bilingual, the better. Uh, I, I, I saw to that uh, 43 years ago when I came to Washington. Um, and I believe that's one of the reasons why our parish, my parish has grown so much. And we have uh, spawned two parishes that came out of St. John's here in DC. Um, and in the Eastern American Diocese, I can count on my one hand parishes that are predominantly Russian. Boston, uh, New York, Washington, Miami. Uh, all the others are, are, are uh, English language parishes. Oh, Lakewood, I'm sorry, Lakewood, that's fine. And Jackson, New Jersey, that's six. Philadelphia, seven. <laughs> so it's two hands. We need two hands to count. Um, <clears throat> so, but it's hard to say. I mean, I, uh, you know, the influx of people coming from Russia has basically dried up. Uh, even before COVID. Um, so we'll see. The main thing is, uh, is for us not to compromise our Orthodox faith, to be on the right path. And I think that the fact that we rejoined with, with the Moscow Patriot uh, has will uh, allow us to be uh, allow us to be more, more in the Russian mode for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you. That's my, that's my subjective opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father, Father Victor, I remember once uh, during one of the conversations, you mentioned that the reality in the Russian church abroad is such that priests uh, have to maintain side jobs. And I kind of disagreed with you when I heard I said, no, no, no. Why do we accept it as a fixed reality? Like you were saying that you didn't want to take any other job that would not have involved you with Russia. And for instance, in my case, I have all my education connected with theology. I don't pronounce this TH sound very well. And when people ask what kind of uh, education do you have? And they would say, oh, zoology, zoology is well, is very good. So because I mean, uh, but uh, I, 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 I kind of think that if we are uh, going to accept it as a fixed reality, then we are going to have it. So, and uh, we have the seminary where we try to uh, prepare priests uh, for, to deal with uh, very different people. As you explained that you were bicultural, you were able to understand people from Russia. And uh, in order to make our future priests to be able to be so so diverse, they need to go to the seminary. But if we treat a seminary as some kind of 
inferior education where you would need to in, invest more time to get a real degree, then we undermine, I think, what we do here. So I wonder if uh, we can change this reality somehow, or maybe there is no way we can change it. So what would be your response to this? Well, uh, over the course of my about 45 years of priesthood, um, I've heard, I've been a member of the diocesan council for endless years. And I remember how many, how often uh, we discussed the need uh, to, for priests to be independent of secular jobs. I was, I was extremely fortunate because the work that I had uh, was not only uh, a secular job, but it was an extension of my priest because the work at the Voice of America was missionary work. The, voice, the work at Bedford Publications with Veronika Stein uh, was also a form of missionary work because I, I smuggled religious broadcasts, uh, religious literature into, into Russia. I was really, I mean, my, I mean, if I even was, if, if my, my parish was able to support me, I would still be willing to work at the Voice of America as a religious broadcaster. That was part and parcel of my priesthood. But the reality is that over the course of these 45 years, I've heard so many conversations uh, from our bishops and at the diocesan council that we need to somehow educate the people to support their priests, uh, to give them a salary, a living salary. And it's not work, unfortunately. Uh, we, can't even, we can't even muster support and financial support to give our priests uh, medical insurance, which is very expensive in America, very expensive. I have medical insurance thanks to my, uh, my former job at the Voice of America. I have very good, I'm a foreign service officer. I have very good insurance. But with the exception of a, a handful of parishes, all the other parishes especially the missionary parish, mission parishes. Uh, they just can't afford to pay the priest a decent salary. That has to change, of course. I, I agree with that. And, and uh, that the people need to be educated about that. I mean, they need to come up with the financial resources uh, to be able to pay their priest a living salary. Even in the OCA, I think there are parishes who can't afford to give their priests the full salary. So it's, I think, with the exception of the Greeks, um, I mean, in the Antiochians, all the other uh, jurisdictions, they're, they're, they're still suffering through this lack of support for their priests, financial support. Uh, but then, on the other hand, uh, in the Greek church, the archdiocese, the priests are afraid to speak their mind because they can they can be fired from their parish. They can be led. The bishop can remove them to drop of a hat. If if a priest uh, says something against uh, what the patriarch Bartholomew is doing right now, he can lose his position. I know two retired Greek priests. We very much want, would love to join the world. One of them is, is like an academic. I think Father Andre knows, I'm not going to mention him because of, uh, who have expressed to me their burning desire to, to leave and join world. World. Ultimately, they didn't because they would lose their pension. So the flip side of that is that uh, being independent of your parish, this is crazy for me to say this, but uh, there are some advantages of that, you know. Uh, and then there are, of course, there, are, there could be act, sort of active lay, laymen who dictate to the priests you know, what need they need to do and whatever, but uh, having a, a secular job and not having to answer to them because they, they control the post screens uh, also has uh, certain advantages. It's not ideal, 
So we, we, we're not living, and of course, the, I think Vokor is Vokor because every young man who becomes a priest knows what he's getting into, at least in the sense that he won't be supported 100% by his parish. So we have idealistic people who, who join the, the priesthood. And that keeps this level of spiritual life at a higher plane, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Uh, thank you, Father Victor, for your wonderful um, your wonderful talk. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, many things stood out for me, but one thing that stood out for me uh, in particular, Father, is you said how when you had distress in your early times as a priest, um, that, that even your Matusha was asking you, do you regret becoming a priest? Um, and you said it kind of gave you thinking that how much maybe you had a different idea of the priesthood before that, and then how your, your mind kind of changed uh, when you sort of experienced these temptations. Um, as, a pre as someone who's been a priest for so many years, what, what advice would you give to us seminarians who are just graduating in about two months or so um, of the, to have a proper understanding of, of, of the priesthood and the stresses that come thereof? Uh, any advice? I think a priest needs to understand that uh, he can't be a dictator in his parish. Um, you know, being a priest here is different from being a priest in Russia uh, in many ways. Uh, I, I, I can tell that uh, uh, for example, we have we have this uh, discussion now going on in our parish. Should we have two possible services at the same time because of COVID? Because we were allowed only 50 people um, in church for, for our services, no more because of the regulations, social distancing and that. So we had this long discussion about having a separate service outside to handle the, the overflow crowd. And this discussion was lasted about an hour and a half. So we basically decided that we would just have one service because we would, it's, it's hard. I, we, we don't want to experiment uh, with the second service on the Pascha because things could go wrong. You have hundreds of people who come once a year. And they don't understand. They don't receive my emails, uh, my announcements. I remember after this long discussion, two members of our parish council who are from Russia um, in frustration asked me, why did we need this meeting? All you need to do, to do was just say what you want to do as a priest and we would do it. Well, of course, in, in, in America, we're all used to, uh, well, democracy. And uh, people have this idea that uh, uh, parish council can decide things. And they forget that in, in Russian, uh, means uh, uh, a body which uh, uh, helps the priest in his, in his ministry. So ultimately, according to our bylaws, the priest has the last word. That, that, that's it. But I've always tried uh, not to dictate my will upon people or my clergy. Uh, I always try to have a conciliary uh, approach, if you will. Um, but um, you will always come across in your future experiences uh, people who want to dictate to, to you their will. Uh, Take off your rose, gla rose colored glasses. Let's put it this way. Um, there are things that uh, the seminary cannot really prepare you for because every single person in your future parishes are all individuals. Uh, there's no general rule 
uh, whereby you which which you can use to administer to every single thing in the same way. Um, it's it could be very challenging. You have people from uh, different ethnic backgrounds. So in my parish, I have many ethnic backgrounds. They come from different cultures, and you have to um, you have to be very very careful about generalizing your approach to, to these people. You have to, every, every person is a, is a unique individual. Uh, um, oh gosh, it's a loaded question and uh, it's, it's hard to come up with a, uh, an answer, frankly. Uh, but I, as I said at the beginning, I. I had this idea as a young priest that, you know, you know the Russian people you know, have great respect for, for the clergy. The Russian people uh, will uh, listen to you, obey you. Um, and when you, when you have a, a first, uh, first encounter with someone who um, thinks a different way and uh, begins gossiping about, about you and your family life and so on and so forth. It, it was a big, for me, it was a big shock, a big shock. And, um, but it was a learning experience at the same time. It helped me take off my rose-colored glasses. Um, so be prepared for any inevitability in, in, your, in, your, in your career to come, or your calling to come. Um, Listen to people. Uh, I think one of the, I'm not a, I'm a very bad example, but I think uh, one of the, su su the most successful priests that I knew, the priests who knew how to listen. You know, when you're hearing, um, well, for example, we, <laughs> even on a, any given Saturday, we have, uh, was this, not of course, before COVID, we would have at least each priest would hear 40 confessions. Uh, we, we're lucky, luckily, we have four priests in our, in our parish, and when we hear confessions, we, one priest serves and the other three hear confessions. But um, when, you, when you're listening to the 40th confession in the evening, you're obviously physically exhausted and mentally exhausted because you're, you know, 40 people have come to you. But the most successful priests uh, are the priests who are able to listen. And this is particularly important in confession. Even if you feel tired and exhausted, you still have to treat that 40th person as if he's the first person who came to you for holy confession. Um, so learn to listen. Uh, before you, you act, before you make any decisions, listening is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. That was really, really good. Thank you. Father Victor, I would like to, uh, <laughs> to be that 40th person and to add to Brother Seraphim's question uh, that uh, what would you uh, what would you advise regarding uh, Choosing, uh, choosing, uh, choosing uh, a future spouse uh, for our seminarians because you mentioned being happily married and so on. Uh, what would you, what, what would you say? Well, for me it was easy. Um, for me it was easy because uh, well, when I went to Jerusalem in 1970, uh, 1970. I first went to Mount Athos, uh, and I was, I went to the uh, St. Elias Keat, which was still in Morocco, and Father uh, Serafim, who was the abbot of this, of this Keat, convinced me to come back to Mount Athos for a whole year, to miss one year of, of study of Jordan Road, to come to help in the skit, which was a very enticing idea because uh, 
I thought to myself, whoa, well, spending a whole year in modern Athos, that would be an education in and of itself. I would be able to visit all the major monasteries, learn the rubrics, uh, get to know monastic life. And I was really taken by Mount Athos and I had started entertaining thoughts about becoming a monk myself. And then after that, I went straight to Jerusalem from Mount Athos. And I joined Vladika Lavr's uh, group in New York. And at the same time, it was a group of young people from uh, Paris and my wife was one of them. And uh, well, to make a long story short, we met at the Holy Sepulchre. We knew each other for four days. And then we, we started corresponding. We went back to Jordanville, of course, my, any thought of monasticism evaporated from my brain. I was so filled with gives in love with my future wife. Uh, we, we corresponded and we, of course, we didn't have internet back then, so it was writing letters to each other. Uh, for until Christmas, I spent uh, those months digging uh, graves at the cemetery to try to make as much money as I could to buy a ticket to Paris. So for spring, Christmas break, I went to Paris and uh, I, I proposed and we, we, we married a year later. So for me, it was easy. But, um, and she was a daughter of a priest. Not only did she know St. John, but she was also a daughter of a priest. So she knew what she was getting into as well. Um, so I would suggest uh, to, to you all that you have to keep your hearts and eyes open. Uh, it's, I think, very important for seminarians to visit parishes and to, uh, to get to know the priests because the priests know the parishioners better. But um, perhaps even ask the priests if they know of any young ladies that uh, are particularly pious in their parish. Um, maybe you could become friends uh, and things could develop. I know that uh, my son-in-law, Father Alexander Vesnikov, he was a seminarian. Unfortunately, he did not graduate from Jordan Blue, but he spent two years there. He was from Australia. Um, he, as a seminary, came to Washington with a group of seminarians to, to attend our Muslims celebration. And he met my daughter. And he kept his heart and eyes open and uh, met my daughter Sonia. And now they're a happily married couple. And he, he's become a priest, a very good priest, I must say. And uh, I think eventually when his life calms down, he'll be able to uh, eventually graduate from Jordanville as well. Uh, he graduated from, from a university. He has a very good, high paying job. So he's financially dependent. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's again, it's hard to give you advice, you know, because again, you are all unique individuals. And, you know, people meet other people differently. Um, but um, once COVID is over and we start to organize tours to the Holy Land, to pilgrimages, to other holy places. Uh, uh, we used to, every year from Washington, we have a pilgrimage to Jordanville. Of course, fortunately, last year we couldn't do this because of COVID, but uh, we always have young ladies who join our pilgrimage to come from Washington. So next time we do that, hopefully next this year, uh, keep your eyes open. The young ladies from Washington. We have many of many, many promising uh, young Orthodox ladies here in, in Washington who sing in our choir, and I think would uh, uh, would, would make fine mothers. And I'm sure the same goes for Lakewood and uh, Lakewood and Boston and other cities on the East Coast. Um, Father Andre. Uh, I'm expecting soon a call from uh, 
uh, from Moscow. I'm doing a uh, uh, interview with Marina Butina, so I have to say goodbye. Yes, yes. on Zoom. Many more years to you, Father Victor, uh, in your ministry. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, okay. God bless you all. I, I need to go. I'm late. Sure. <laughs>